Hello. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everybody really enjoyed the morning sessions. I uh, want to say a special thank you to all of our college presidents that participated in the, the first podcast, and per, per, particularly to Shane Snipes from the Borough of Manhattan Community College that kind of envisioned it. So um, we're going to be sharing that out, and I encourage you all um, to listen to it. There was some very rich discussion, um, not only about the role of presidents and kind of providing leadership uh, to allow all of us to be entrepreneurial, but also on issues of um, equity and inclusion, which is, is just very impactful. So I thank everyone who's participated in all of the panels this morning. I'd also like to begin, um, too, by just thanking Tarrant County College District and Chancellor Gene Giovannini and his staff for just hosting us in the most wonderful way. So I would like anybody from Tarrant County, including the Chancellor, to stand and be recognized. So at this time, it's my pleasure to bring up our first keynote speaker, and I uh, had a chance to um, meet him actually at the time when I was working for uh, Burlington County College um, in New Jersey, running their foundation. He uh, raised his hand and called our office and said, I want to donate a 3D printer to the college. And I said, OK. So we did this amazing uh, ribbon cutting. I've gotten to know him now over the five or six years um, you know, since that time being at the college and now being at Nate and you know he is very much a servant leader we talk about that a lot he lives it he, he speaks all over the world now he runs a very successful business uh, very entrepreneurial in what he does and he, he's just a, a wonderful person the last journal we profiled uh, I think his second book that he had written and he has produced CDs and he's probably contemplating something else right now sitting in his chair so it is my great pleasure to welcome Mr. Sam Thayanayagam to the stage who is going to get us started so let's give him a round uh, of applause I was born in the beautiful island of Sri Lanka it's shaped like a teardrop really well known for its blue sapphires and rubies known for its cinnamon and cardamom and cloves that are used in households all over the world. And um, I remember about 25 years ago when I took my now wife on her first date. She's a coal miner's daughter from Uniontown and I'm all the way from the island of Sri Lanka. And we went to a little restaurant in Philadelphia on 16th and Dickerson called Strolly's. And you, the beautiful thing about this restaurant was the food was extremely good and it was very cheap. And so we sat down to eat. Again, my wife from Western Pennsylvania, me from Sri Lanka, I had got to know her through her sister. We had kind of met at church. And when we were talking, I told her about a story that happened to me when I was 10 years old. At 10 years old, my, my mother wasn't able to make it because she was pregnant with our youngest brother. But we went to a sanctuary in the southern part of Sri Lanka and we had taken another family with us. We had been to this sanctuary so many times and so this wasn't special for us. But my father was full of anticipation because we had taken another family and he had built it up about seeing elephants in the wild. And so we had got there, it was this family with their children, their mother was pregnant too, and they were both very pregnant. And so as you could imagine, in, a, in, in dusty and difficult roads, it was probably the, not the best for them to go with us. And so they stayed home, and so it was fathers, children, a driver, and a tracker. And we spent most of the day tracking elephants. And as luck would have it, we went to all of the different places that we had seen elephants so many times before, but we could not find an elephant. And it was getting late, and it was getting dark. But my father wouldn't give up. So he tells the driver and the tracker, he says, you know, we gotta, we gotta show these people elephants. They've come from a long way, and we gotta show them elephants. And so we went into this, little cove, it's called a villua, and it's because there was a water hole, 
And there was only one way to get in and one way to get out. And so we get to this villa. We had been there before. And lo and behold, we saw about 60 elephants about 50 to 60 yards away. Everybody was so excited. My uncle, who had, was seeing elephants for the first time in the wild, was almost out of the vehicle taking pictures. When all of a sudden, because there was kids in this herd, this mother elephant started to charge us. And it was unbelievable because what happened next was unbelievable pandemonium because the driver did not trust the tracker, the tracker did not trust the driver, and my father is trying to tell my uncle to come in. And to make a long story short, you know, we were able to whip the car around. The tracker was trying to actually do a chant to stop the elephant, but our driver, he wasn't having any of it. He whipped the car around, and we some or other managed to escape that moment. And here I am talking to my future wife about this, and I, I can tell you, 25 years later, she married me. She bought that story, and she married me. And a little while ago, about two years ago, I ran into the, the other family friend, because they had children, and you know they had gone on to being in school in the US. And I said to this lady, I said, listen, at some point, we are going to have to get our families together and make sure that our children realize that this really happened. This was not some tall story that I made up because I wanted you know, this girl to end up marrying me. But as a young boy, I started to learn to go into the wild in order, in order to be able to see animals. But before I get into the meat of the conversation, I would like to tell you why I'm here. The first reason I'm here is because I was invited by a really lovely person, somebody I've come to respect and somebody that I've come to admire because she does great work. The second reason I'm here is because at, at the age 22 was when I first came to the US. I came to the US as a high school dropout, but having done the TOEFL and also having done some night school because I wanted to further my education. And I came to a small community college in Michigan very similar to the ones that you represent here. As presidents, as administrators, as business development people, you know, you make a huge impact. And so I'm here because this, what you're doing here is very close to my heart. And the third reason I'm here is to say thank you. Because the reason I was able to finish a degree, and I was able to finish a degree in three years, because not only was I able to go to that community college, I was then able to transfer credits from Sri Lanka to that community college and finish an associate degree in business. And it was because of people like you, you know, who heard me, saw me, spent time with me, that I was able to start to get steady and work myself towards a four-year degree. So I believe in what you do. I want to say thank you. But I also, hopefully, in the next 10, 15 minutes, would like to provoke you a little bit. Because it's, it's good to have fun and, and to feel comfortable, but it's also important as people who are entrepreneurs for us to get a little, get a feel, a, feel a little dissatisfaction, feel a little uncomfortable. So without further ado, we'll get into this, uh, what I'm going to be speaking on today. About two years ago, I asked my youngest brother, who hadn't been on this particular safari, what he would like to do, because I, had, I was going to Ghana to speak, and I had been in Ghana before, and I wanted to take this opportunity to go to another African country. And when I said to him, hey, would you like to do something like this, he said, he said, he said to me, I would love to go and be a part of a safari. So we flew into Kenya, and we spent a few days you know, in, in, the, in the Maasai Mara and spending time with the Maasai people. So we landed there, you know, in a, in a little, in a bush plain. And as we were, as we were picked up and we spent the next two to three days, I'm trying to get this. 
Okay, there you go. I spent a, a whole day with the Maasai people. And I, when I was spending time with them, I learned a new word. The new word was pastoralist. The Maasai people, they are pastoralists. And what that means is that they are people who take care of their pasture, or they take care of their, their flock, and they go where the opportunity is. So they are uh, people that are extremely mobile, right? They don't, they don't stay still. They are con constantly going to where there is water and where there is places for their cattle to graze. And so as I spent time with them, I learned a little bit about what that, what that means, what it means to be a Maasai people. And it's interesting that these people, they don't write down a lot of stuff. So a lot of their learning actually comes from, comes from being able to spend time and in relationship. So the first thing I would like to, to kind of highlight is in, in entrepreneurship, it's extremely important to have the right people on the bus. You know, and, and what does that look like, right? And so uh, in my own company, it is very important that sometimes when I have actually acquired a company. So when you acquire a company, there are people who come with the company, right? So you don't necessarily have an opportunity to be able to now go ahead and choose. But it's just important that even when you are working with existing people, as a, your responsibility as a leader is to work with them to make sure that they are occupying the right seat on the bus. One of the things that we do, and I'm sure you do this in education, is we use something called a disk profile. You know, I, I never want to put the wrong, you know, I don't want to put a square peg in a round hole. And it's, and as you know, training is, is expensive, right? You don't want people to come in there and, you know, after three to four months, things are not working out, they quit. It's best to do the work up front, right? And we do a lot of hiring through our current network. I very rarely use a hiring agency because I find that my network is the best place to hire. But it's just very important that, that, you, that you surround yourself with the right people. The second thing is that it's important that you have a right mix of public and private partnership. One of the exciting things of being here at dinner last night and a session, a couple of sessions this morning, is I see that mix here. Right? We, we need to, in America, we need to make sure that that's in balance. I come from a, a socialist country, and I understand you know, what government can do and really what government doesn't do well. And a great model, actually, to follow is the Panama Canal. About uh, six or seven years ago, I went to visit the Panama Canal. Because the amazing thing about the Panama Canal is that the French actually raised money in, in, in private markets in order to be able to execute the Panama Canal, and they ran out of money. But what the Americans did, what we did, was we used public funding in order to be able to create that canal. It was a great undertaking, and some would argue that it is the number one most important thing that the US did to create the American century. But what we don't necessarily think about is once the government actually helped with creating the canal and building that infrastructure, it was entrepreneurs who actually took advantage of that infrastructure and did what we do best and it set up the American century. So I know that I'm speaking to the choir here but I think it's still important for us to recognize that there are some things that government does really well, but there are other things that are best left to private enterprise, and, and it takes wisdom to know the difference. Know the major employers and stakeholders. You know, one of the things that, that I do in our business and something that my team does very well is we not, when we are shaping something, when we are putting something together, not only are we thinking about our customer, but our customer's customer, right? Sometimes we find that the customer that is in front of us is pretty obvious, right? But we need to dig a little further to see, you know, is there a customer's customer? You know, to, for community colleges, you know, I wonder 
how many of you are actually building relationships with the hiring managers of the employers that, that are in your, that in your space? Do you know them by name? Do they, know the, do they know your facility? Do they know the kinds of things that you offer? Because truly, the people that are hiring your students are your customer. But the truth of the matter is, an organization doesn't hire anyone. The people in that organization hire somebody. So it's very easy when you ask somebody, hey, do you know who your customer is? It's very easy to say, yeah, so-and-so is my customer. But it's not General Electric or Lockheed Martin or the US Air Force. It's the people within that organization that are doing that. And the only way that you're going to get to know them is to start to think differently about it, ask the right questions. Don't ask the questions that you already know the answers to. Ask difficult questions. Because sometimes it takes time to get to the right answer. And sometimes answers are not going to find us right away. And I know that in talking to people yesterday and today that you guys get this, that the community college does a very good job of understanding your sources of funds and the economic impact that you'll make day to day. So I am kind of talking to people who are already well on this journey already. One of the neatest things that my brother and I saw on our trip was cheetahs in the wild. And the most beautiful thing was not only did we see cheetahs in the wild, we also saw a mother cheetah actually training these little cubs on how to hunt. And, and this was as the sun was going down one day, and, and we sat and watched for over 45 minutes to see how this cheetah acted. And when we talk about the, the African jungle and we talk about what's going on here, it's very important that speed kills, right? Speed absolutely kills. It's, just, it's, like, it's like playing football, right? Speed kills, and, and it's just important that, that we understand that. You know, what are the projects that you're working on that you're sitting on, you know, and that your people are sitting on? You know, is it time to get the organization ready to go and to start working on something? I created, a, I created a DVD called A Recipe for Successful Entrepreneurship, where I talk about 10 different ingredients. And one of the ingredients that I talk about is failing fast, right? It's just important for us to get into the water, right? It is important for us to try something, right? Because only when you try something are you going to learn from it. You know, my oldest son works for me, and about two weeks ago, they were implementing a new process in the paint line. And, two, you know, and about a week into it, the whole thing that they were doing absolutely collapsed. And my older son, I'm sure, was extremely disappointed because you know what it's like to work for your father, right? You're trying to make sure that you know, you're trying to live up to the expectations of a father. And I know that he was crushed. But I said to him, son, that's all right. You know, take it from where it is figure out what happened differently or wrong, and fix it, and, and keep moving forward. It's extremely important as part of this speed understanding to be able to, 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 to execute and to be able to do that really, really well. One thing that I noticed about being in the Maasai Mara is that not everybody, like the lion, doesn't go after an antelope. You know why? Because the lion is not fast enough to go after that antelope. So guess what? It's the cheetah that goes after the antelope. You know, every one of these species has a certain prey that they know that they can go after. It's important for us as entrepreneurs and who are people who are working entrepreneurially that we understand the priorities, what we are good at. What should we be working on? And also, what should not we be working on? Because end of the day, when you're working in a community college or when you're working in a business, you have limited resources. And it's extremely important to be able to mobilize those resources in the places that is going to give you your biggest return. 
and it's leadership's responsibility to be able to do that. So I commend you for being at a place like this, where not only did you bring what you know, but you also are here to learn and to be able to listen to other people, to be able to talk back and forth, to say, hey, you know, I, I tried this and it didn't work, or I tried this, it worked, you ought to try that, right? Extremely important for us to be able to work with speed because uh, it is what's gonna keep us, it is what is gonna keep us relevant for us to work quickly. This is one of my favorite videos because this particular place in the Masai Mara was a place that we went to two to three days in a row. And, and what is happening here is, is that's a water buffalo, right? And that water buffalo was killed about a day ahead, right? And so what happens is that family feeds on that carcass for quite some time, right? And then, guess what? After, the, after, after, that, one, any, after that one family eats, Right? There are many others that get to eat there as well. So it's not a one kill and done. You know, I was told that you know, then you see hyenas eating. Then you see vultures eating. Right? And then when the carcass actually decomposes, right, even the little bugs in the earth are eating. Right? And so the most amazing thing about entrepreneurship is that there's a lot of people counting on us to create success. And it's just very important for, for us. You know, failure is not an exception, right? Because what I find as an entrepreneur is, you know, I'm able to create meaningful work. You know, there are people who are depending on me to go in every day and to be able to do what I do. And so it is for you, right? The work that you do is extremely valuable and extremely important because you are really working with that clay. You know, you're molding and shaping the next person of entrepreneur, entrepreneurship. And guess what? You're not, you're not doing this only for them, but you're also doing this with an entrepreneurial mindset, right? Because young people, you know, I, I have five children. You know, they, they call BS on me just like that. <laughs> Even going out to eat is such a, a decision. I sometimes, you know, I feel like you know, everybody has a different place they want to go to and a different thing that they want to do. I, I might make a good politician someday all because I have to bring kind of collaboration between, you know, seven of us. But going back to everybody eats, you know, what, what you do matters and what I do matters because there's a lot of, there's a lot at stake, right? in what we do, in the taxes we pay, and, and it does trickle down. Because I know for myself, when I bought this company in Philadelphia a year ago, it was a mess. It looked like a junkyard. And I'm not somebody who easily gets anxious, but the day after I bought the company, I went in there and I started to look around at it, and I had like an anxiety attack. And I thought, what have I got into? But guess what? Over a period of time, right? By, by you know, the fact that I have developed people, you know, uh, a faith in God, a faith in myself, in the faith in other people, I started to put something together. And one of these days, you know, we're going to be one of the best places to work in Philadelphia. Guess what? Because as we do this, right, success creates more success, as well as people are counting on it, because there's a lot of people who need work. And it's our responsibility to be able to do that. I was chatting to two ladies during the cocktail yesterday. A lady from Waukeka, Wisconsin was telling me that the way entrepreneurship goes, the way the US goes. And I was like, wow, I, I never, I, I always knew, I always knew that entrepreneurship had a huge place in, the, in who America is. But I didn't realize it was that significant. So what we do really, really matters. One of the most beautiful things about the Masai Mara is the fact that the, the, the Masai Mara and the Serengeti, which is in the next, in the next country over, are, 
is actually used by these animals. They actually, this is called, I think they call the great migration. And once a year, they actually leave the Masai Mara and they go to the Serengeti. And then when, when, the, when it's dry in the Serengeti, they come back. And it's amazing that one of the things that I noticed was that it's very, very important for animals to clay, stay close to water. I remember we were doing an early morning drive around 5.30, 6 o'clock, and I see this huge hippo. You know, it was like probably a mile away from water, and I could see it just, you know, it, it was, you've never seen a hippo walk that fast. And I asked the tracker, like, where, you know, why is this hippo in such a hurry? And he said, well, he needs to get to water, right, before it gets too hot, right? And what did I learn from that is, as, as entrepreneurs, it's extremely important. And people who think entrepreneurially, it's very important for us to understand cash. It's important for us when we start something that we know exactly how to monetize it. Right? A lot of people have great ideas, but not necessarily are they able to get to cash. And, and as, as people who are students of entrepreneurship, people who are working in entrepreneurship, it's ex extremely important for us to stay liquid. You know, it's important, it's impo and we need to continue to talk about it. I met with, a, I met with one, of my, one of my people's uh, daughters, and she was planning to go to a four-year university in the South, extremely smart person who hadn't got a scholarship, which, which she should have got, was planning on paying full board to go to a university in the South that had a fantastic football program to do pre-med. I sat down and talked to that lady, and I said, hey, what about going to a community college close by for a couple of years, right? She didn't want to hear it. But at least I asked her the tough question, right? The return on investment for these students is extremely important. As you guys know, college debt is a huge issue, and it's just important as, as we think as entrepreneurs and are entrepreneurs that we are always thinking cash to cash, you know? And, and one of the concepts that I teach is creativity before capital for a couple of reasons. A lot of people constantly think everything is a money problem. I had, a, I had a leader who used to tell me, Sam, it's not a money problem, it's an idea problem, right? It's, you know, be creative, use your mind, right? Stop throwing money at something, right? And learn how to, how to be creative in being able to, before you apply capital. Doesn't mean that money is not important, money is important. Right, but it's very important for us to think about things you know, with regard to money and make sure that we are constantly managing our cash because it's an important aspect. Um, and, and trust is important. I'm gonna talk a little more about that. Right, the brand is important. Right, and we need to, you know, the, the thing about animals is that they're very careful about following that scent. So even if they can't see, they can smell. And they're following that scent all around to make sure they're getting to their prey. And as we talk in terms of brand, we talk, we talk in terms of value proposition, we talk in terms of what we are doing different, it's extremely important to keep telling that story about what we are good at being intentional about it, and bring, being able to build that in the community. And I would also say it's important to be strategic about it, meaning you just don't go out and just keep talking about stuff. It's very important that your message is crafted correctly for the right person, right, in the right, in the, for the right audience, in the right frequency, saying the right things. Because I recognize that a community college, very similar to a small business, has limited resources. And how we spend that is extremely important. I would like to leave you with this. And that is my one year at community college. These are the things that I experienced at a community college. This is what I saw at a community college. I saw and I met people who had empathy. Empathy for me, empathy for the things that they were working on. You know, they were people who were proximity. Why? They, they lived in your communities, right? They were people who, who lived right there. They were people who were familiar. 
you know, when I went and I talked to the, to the registrar about transferring my credits from Sri Lanka, I had actually beaten, at, beaten him at ping pong a couple of times. I didn't, uh, during lunchtime, I didn't realize that you know, I had to go to him, I would have let him win a few times. But when I went to him, I already knew him, right? So it was a very easy conversation, right? I, I, I saw that people were flexible. You know, they knew that I could not work outside school, right? Because I, I had an F1 visa, I couldn't work outside school. But they allowed me to use their auto shop to wash cars so that I could make some extra money right, in order that I could get my laundry done and I could, you know, pay for that chocolate eclair that I love so much, right? So it's the, it's the flexibility standpoint and it was the intimacy, right? I did, you know, I, I did Accounting 100, which is not even a, a college level course, right? And I took it with a lady. I still remember her name. Kathy McGarrett was her name. I did so well in that 100 class that, you know, when I did 101 and 102, the, the counselor who was also my teacher, you know, wanted me to go into accounting, right? There was an intimacy about that relationship that I had built with this person. So these are the things that I see as an outsider, as a former student and somebody who continues to work in the, in the foundation to help develop that, that school. This is what I see. This is what you have to offer to your students, to your community, for future entrepreneurs. And so, I just want to say thank you for having me one more time, and uh, I, I wish you all the best for a continued great, great conference. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone enjoyed their lunch. Um, I'm so excited to announce, as many of you guys already know, that next year's conference is going to be in Newport Beach, California. So we are so excited to be going out to California. And as you guys can see up on the stage, that's our save the date. Um, and if you flip to the next slide as well, too, you can see some of the important dates coming up here. So we already are going to be accepting call for proposals here in just a few months. So as you're attending sessions today, you can already be thinking about what you want to submit for next year. So, all right, without further ado, I want to go ahead and welcome Debbie Cooley to the stage. Debbie was um, recommended to us by our lovely uh, Tarrant County um, Conference Committee, and she and I have been able to talk a bunch over the phone as well and gotten to be able to get to know one another. And so I think you guys will really enjoy hearing her story as well, too. So if Debbie wants to make her way up to the stage, that's great. We can give her a round of applause. Good afternoon, and thank you for that warm welcome. It is truly my privilege to be here with you today. I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone I've met that's involved with NACI. You're truly an incredibly well-organized professional and class organization. I was a guest on a panel at Tarrant County Community College here in Fort Worth, and I was totally impressed with the depth of the questions from the professors and the students. It was a great reflection on Tarrant County College and community colleges in general. Also, I've got to mention Elva LeBlanc. I don't want to embarrass you, Elva, because she's so sweet and humble, but she's one of the most perfect people I know, and I'm glad to know you. I also would especially like to thank Leah Deppert for her patience and her thoroughness. Leah called me back in April and asked if I'd be able to speak here at NACI. I said, of course, it'd be my honor to do so. Around July 1st, I thought I'd better put a few thoughts in an outline. I was drawing a blank and didn't get much past, thank you for having me. So I put my notepad down, assured myself something will come to you. After several sittings at staring down at the blank paper, the paper actually spoke and said, put down your pen, your pad, back away. You don't write speeches. You sit on panels and answer questions about your life and your journey. And of course, I know all those answers. No preparation needed, just hair comb, shoes match, and try not to curse when I answer the questions. So I called Leah and I told her I hadn't written a word and evidently was blocked. I left the door wide open for her to say, okay, well, we can find another speaker. Instead, Leah responded with how inspiring my story is and how she was certain that I would inspire the audience. No pressure, Leah. The last time I prepared remarks was in the ninth grade when I gave a book report on The Last of the Mohicans. Also, this April will be my company's 20th anniversary and I still don't have a business plan. So I'm thinking, what in the world do I have to tell you professors out here about entrepreneurs. 
So if any of you guys want to switch with me, I'm good with that. And also, if your inspiration overload hits you, let me know and I'll stop. I'll slow down a little bit. Um, but truly, I'll always be indebted to community colleges and the opportunity that they provided to so many young people. I was one of the many young people that didn't have a clue what I wanted to do or be when I grew up. So when it came time to pick a college in 1970, several of my friends were planning to attend Tyler Junior College in Tyler, Texas. They mainly wanted to be Apache Bells, which Apache Bells are similar to the Kilgore Rangerettes, except we're better. And, and, and halftime shows used to be televised. So if you were an Apache Bell, you got to be on national television several times each year. For me, that's as good a reason as any for picking a college. So that's where I spent my first two years. Side note, 1970 was the first year women could wear pants on campus. I'm eternally grateful for the experiences and the opportunity at TJC. I'm sure I would have floundered at a, four -year, a large four-year university with three to 400 people in the classes. Community, colleges, community college gave me an economical value to begin my college experience. I had saved my money from high school jobs and was able to afford the tuition, which in 1970 was $100 per semester. The cafeteria plan was an additional $25. TJC also gave me the tools I employed over the next two years at UT Austin, Hookham, where I studied dance and athletics. What I learned in the UT Sports Department is carried over to two succeeding generations. I was a softball pitcher. I then taught my daughter to pitch. She was chosen as a fast pitch all-star pitcher, and my eight-year-old grandson is a top-round draft pick in the Little League. He pitched a no-hitter in his first outing. I unashamedly take some of the credit for this. Community College also gets a chunk of the credit. If I hadn't learned what I needed at TJC with their patience and their understanding that we were a bunch of 17, 18 year olds that really didn't have a clue, especially me, I wouldn't have gotten into UT and been able to play sports. As you'll hear, sports, and still, sports has and still does play a large role in my life. As community college educators, it is truly awesome the wonderful work you do in this exemplary example of higher learning. You come to work each and every day with the passion and fire it takes to mold minds and serve your community by, op by opening doors and knocking down barriers. It's hard work, but you're vital to moving us forward and keeping academia on the proper track. My path to entrepreneurship was long and winding. Statistically, my odds weren't great. I didn't come from wealth or privilege. Both of my parents were alcoholics. My childhood included all the things that go along with that, failure, excuses, Frustration, anger, and deficiency were a part of my daily experience. The extended family, aunts, uncles, and grandmother all waited on their social security checks. Clearly, there were no conversations about achievement or success or accomplishment. I spent most of my time in the top of the mimosa tree in our front yard playing with my autistic brother. The best days were when the social security checks arrived. This isn't a victim story, but there certainly weren't any roads paved for me. However, there is always something good that comes from everything. For instance, my father was a gambler. On football game days, my job was to monitor two football games on the radio or TV if it was televised in the back bedroom and let my dad know each time a team scored. He would then make a phone call. I thought he and his friends just really, really liked football. I didn't realize he was calling his bookie. The good thing about this overload of football was that I heard how important it is to never quit Always be prepared, leave it all on the field, and never for an instant walk away from the game wondering if you did absolutely everything you could do to be victorious. Another sharp bend in my track was overcoming, overcoming obstacles after marrying a manipulative, controlling husband. Psychology 101, I married into what I was familiar with, the same constant criticism I heard from my mother. My mother was unhappy and angry and remarked often that she wished she had never had children. She criticized everyone and everything often. Of course, I took her cutting remarks about me as fact. It was much later in life that I realized my mother's behavior was a manifestation of her frustrations with her own life. But like all things, you take the good with the bad. I've mentioned the not so good things about my family and I feel it's only right to mention some of the positive things. My mother and father were witty, high energy, and very intelligent. My mother could finish the New York Times puzzle in light speed. She also gave me my fight. My fight has come in really handy sometimes, and it sometimes really gets me in trouble. My father, also a child of alcoholics, was a kind person who gave me my love of all things natural and of the wildlife and outdoors. 
He never spoke of anyone's station in life nor their ethnicity or color. My father would bring fresh fruit home each week from a nearby fruit stand and mention the, name, the person named Bob that worked there. I knew he enjoyed talking with Bob. All that I knew about Bob was his name. After a couple of years, I was with my dad one day when he stopped by the fruit stand and I met Bob, a paraplegic black man. After my daughter was born in 1978, I went back to school and while reading my textbook, I learned that I had a 98.4% chance of never getting out of the class to which I was born. I thought that was nonsense, but it was always in the back of my head. Then I realized the choices I was making were a product of my experiences and surroundings. I knew then that I had to make changes in my surroundings in order to break the cycle of my family's relationship with failure. I needed to look for a different track. The thing I found about finding a track is that it isn't marked. If you don't have guides and advocates or examples to follow, it's doubtful you'll even know there is a track, let alone figure out which one is the right one. Or the path diverges, as it always does, and it may be difficult to decide which direction to go. Something I've often been frustrated with in my life is that I feel like I'm the fastest runner in the world, but I just can't find the track. I used to have a recurring dream that I was chosen for the Olympic track team. Remember, I was in sports a lot. And um, on the day of my race at the Olympics, I got to the stadium, but I couldn't find the gate for me to walk in to get to the track. As I was frantically trying to find a way to get in the stadium, the starting gun went off, and then I would wake up. I've experienced a self-doubt and sleepless nights that go along with entrepreneurship. When I think about where it all began, I look back to 1974 when I was the first woman hired for outside sales at a major industrial packaging supplier. There literally weren't any women in outside sales in 1974. My salary was $600 a month. A man hired the same day was paid $1,000 a month. When I inquired as to why my salary for the same job was 60% of what my male counterpart was, I was told that $600 was all that corporate would allow them to pay a woman. Speaking of corporate, the vice president flew in from the home office in Tuscaloosa to ask me a few weeks before I actually started making sales calls what I would do if a buyer asked me to come to his hotel room to get an order. I really did, I really was asked that. I thought, well, okay. Did he really, did I really hear that? I took a deep breath and responded with, I was told to do whatever it takes to get an order. He was stricken, jumped back, hands out, I still remember, and I said, gotcha. And uh, <laughs> needless to say, he didn't appreciate my humor, but I got out of the situation without having to dignify such a ridiculous question. As I readied for my first day of outside sales, I realized I would fail. Clearly, I had been hardwired for failure. I had never known anyone that was successful. There wasn't a shadow of a doubt in my mind that I wouldn't fail. In order for me to never have any regrets or wonder if I did everything I could, I very carefully put a plan together so I would never look back and wonder if I had given it all I had and left it all on the field reflect back to my football monitoring days when I aided and abetted my dad's gambling. I executed my plan for failure with precision. The next thing I knew, three months later, I got a $100 a month raise. Within 18 months, I was in the big four, which was a top four sales award out of 17. Well, ladies, we've come a long way since 1974. At that time, barely 30% of the national workforce was comprised of women, compared to nearly 50% today with women earning 77 cents per dollar earned by men. We aren't out of the woods yet, but we've made progress. And I know we're just getting this freight trade rolling. Okay, here we are today. I'm proud to say I'm the president of a very successful corporation, Impact Incorporated. We are an industrial packaging and tactical gear supplier for the private sector, federal, state, and local government agencies. We work on behalf of the men and women of our armed forces as well as a portfolio of aerospace industry related projects and major retailers and are currently, we currently have multiple federal contracts throughout the nation. We design packaging for anything and everything you can imagine from coffee beans to drone aircraft and truly we are the best in the business. It was those 25 years in packaging sales working under a myriad of demanding bosses being undervalued and underpaid that compelled me to found IMPAC. My salary at the $93 million company I was working for prior to starting IMPAC was $43,500. The rest of the sales team was male and their starting salaries were 100,000. 
There was absolutely no difference in our duties. In fact, I felt like I was actually carrying more of the load and my division was the most profitable in the company. Oftentimes, a salesman would say, Deb, can you help me with this? I told the customer we would get it done today. Then I'd hear them telling customers, we will get the samples out to you today, and we will fax over pricing to you today. I removed my nameplate from the door and replaced it with a sign that said, we. When the <laughs> salesman asked why I had we on the door, I told them that every time they made a promise that we would get something done, it was given to me. So I figured my name must be we. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. As the hours and workload increased and the pay didn't, I struggled with remaining employed but was constantly reminded that I needed to get my daughter out of college as I was the only source of assistance she had. I finally realized I had to leave before I allowed the frustration and fight in me to overload my mouth and get myself fired. So on April 9th, 1999, Impact Incorporated was born. While struggling to make ends meet, while paying the college tuition, I started Impact in my garage with a whopping $10,000 in my savings account. It wasn't exactly what you'd call a sophisticated operation back in 1999. The inventory for my customers was stored in my garage, and then my den, and then my dining room, and on occasion, the bedrooms. I was being very cautious. I was waiting for that magic moment when my daughter got out of college so I could be a little, little less defenses, defensive and become offensive. I was a truck driver, accounts receivable and payable, receptionist and salesperson. However, that wasn't nearly as hard as trying to get credit from vendors. My credit was excellent, but they did not believe I could actually be successful at the helm of an industrial packaging company. The companies like mine were and mostly still are started and run by men. I remember meeting a vendor in a grocery store parking lot and with a pencil and paper scratching off the impression of a credit card for security. Most vendors didn't even offer that. They wanted me to be COD without ever checking my credit. But it is with the utmost pride to report to you today that this year Impact is projected to have sales of over $12 million. Thank you. Thank you. We have locations in Texas, South Carolina, Illinois, and Tennessee. We've received an Edison Award for Sustainable Packaging, SBA Vendor of the Year Award, have a GSA Exceptional Rating, recognized by Inc. 5,000 five consecutive years, and were honored as one of three finalists for Small Business of the Year with the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce two years consecutively. This leap took more than just courage. It took work, a lot of hard work. Of course, it does for everyone starting a business. This is what we must instill in the younger generation. They cannot and must not be afraid of that small garage, the lack of a safety net, the risk of going out on their own, or the possibility of failure. It's that mentality that makes a strong and able-minded individual. It is our shared responsibility and men as mentors and educators to teach this to our young women and men. It is one of the quickest ways we can truly nurture them by arming them with the ability, intellect, and wherewithal to stand alone at times, to find the inner strength and fortitude to rise after being knocked down, and find the track based on the examples from others they have observed, not because barriers were removed, or hurdles made lower, but because they were taught how to handle these challenges and face them head on. It is challenges and turbulence that create opportunities for success and achievement and pushes us to discover new ways of doing things. In your roles as educators, you act as guides in helping your students find their track. I knew early on that my first step to a better life was to go to college, and it was a community college that got me, got me directed on my first track. Then when it was time for my daughter, Anna, to go to college, our plan was for her to attend a local college near where we lived at the time. This way she could commute and live at home. The summer before her senior year in high school, Anna announced that she wanted to attend TCU, which is a private college here in Fort Worth. I explained there's no way, absolutely not, we can't afford it. The difference in the tuition between local state schools and TCU was somewhere between twenty dollars and $25,000 annually. She then continued with presenting her case by reminding me that she would be transferring in 12 AP credits and that she could work. I explained all of that's fine and good, but still would not be enough to satisfy the tuition requirements for TCU. She then replied with, but mom, their business and communication schools are nationally recognized. As I continued with my absolutely out of the question responses, I heard myself giving my daughter the same responses I always got growing up. I heard no so often, I quit asking and slowly but surely quit believing. 
I never wanted my daughter to stop asking or to stop believing. So I thought I could at least research all the grants and loans and financial aid so I could give her the hard facts that would finally convince her that TCU was out of the question. After all, she was a good kid and had an excellent 4.0 grade average. So after looking at all the financial aid and loans available, sure enough, we found a way for her to attend TCU. I learned two things from that experience. That my daughter believed me when I told her to go for what you want, that no mountain is too high. The other was that I still had not convinced myself that I could accomplish what I needed to. And I wasn't listening to my own words. Anna graduated from TCU with a degree in communication in 2001 and $35,000 in loans. She now works as a vice president of sales for Impact and has two intelligent, talented, athletic, beautiful children, which are my grandchildren. By the way, that communication degree has been priceless. I've been told I'm a bit too direct, tactless, and sometimes hurt people's feelings. <laughs> My daughter, in turn, has a way of telling people the same exact thing as I did, and they walk away thinking they have given, been given the best compliment of their lives. <laughs> I always tell her that Bachelor of Science degree is certainly a degree in BS. <laughs> <laughs> I have a profound understanding of the importance of entrepreneurship and the role education plays in developing in, it, in our community. Entrepreneurs run small businesses, design tools that help us stay connected, and are searching for new ways to help society's biggest problems. The economic growth of our city, state, and country depend on them, and many of them first depend on, depend on educators such as you. Education acts as a precursor to entrepreneurial activity and can shape students' mindsets. There's a fascinating shift occurring now instead of educational institutions primarily urging students to seek conventional positions in medicine, law, or the corporate world, they are now providing students with the knowledge, skills, and motivation to encourage entrepreneurial success. I know you've seen these individuals in your classrooms, the ones possessing entrepreneurial traits such as tenacity, leadership, introspection, interdependence, passion, optimism, and the motivation to make a difference. It's just a matter of having the know-how to nurture those traits. Please also be aware of the Debbies in your classes that are only dreaming but not believing. The Debbies that have been told that they can't do a damn thing, for every Debbie that has beaten the odds, there are a million who have not. There are a million Debbies watching life go by but not having the slightest clue how to find their track. Let's help the Debbies and the Freds and the Bills and the Susans find the track. Let's encourage them to dream and dream big. I read something one time that said, dream as big as you can and shoot for the moon. If you don't reach the moon, you'll likely land on a star. There's certainly plenty of stories of people born in much more challenging circumstances than I who have attained much greater heights than I. Almost always these people have had someone in their court, a coach, a cheerleader. Let's be their cheerleaders and help them find the track where they can be the fastest runner in the world. Community colleges have a long history of promoting entrepreneurial programs and no resource is more prevalent and more readily available to aspiring entrepreneurs than nearby community colleges. While sometimes your jobs may feel thankless, I'd like to convey to you, you were life-changing for me. So I would like to convey to you all my appreciation for the work you've done daily to drive innovation, fuel growth, and make it a better world. If there's just one thing I could leave with you is that if I can do it, anybody can. If you just go for it, trust your instincts, give it everything you've got, and refuse to give up, it's attainable unless you quit you're still in the game. Always know you can come back in the fourth quarter and score the winning touchdown. Thank you for the honor of being with you here today and allowing me to speak. I encourage you to hear these words. It doesn't matter what you've gone through, where you're going or where you're from, there are no excuses. Instill in your students that they have the capability to find their own track. I would like to share one last thing from notes from the universe. I have to continually motivate myself. I'm like the veteran that hears, that's home from the war that hears a loud noise and they dive under the desk. I metaphorically dive under the desk when things go um, south. I do, I have gained the skills though to get myself back up out of that desk and keep going. Do you know what's a million times better than getting to the top of the mountain? It's getting there after having been lost. Thank you very much. Now, we are going to have a short 
little conversation um, with a couple of folks that really are here to help us. I'm very excited about it. So I'd like to invite to the stage um, some of our federal partners. These are folks that occupy very kind of high level positions um, in DC and do a lot of good work, but they've uh, really spent the time to spend not only just a session, but several days with us. So. Please, Alan Gutierrez from the SBA, join me at the stage. And then I would like um, to, uh, Alan, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Bob Griesbach from the USDA to come forward. And my, uh, I guess, psychic twin, uh, if it was the only way I could think of to describe him, Joe Cap, whom many of you know. So let's give them all a round of applause. So if you want to sit here, and Robert, if you want to sit here, and then I don't know where Joe is. Oh, there he is. So, Joe, I'll have you sit there at the end. So it'll be a, a little book cover, and um, I love you dearly, and, and I respect the two of you immensely. So I'm going to draw your attention to the timer <laughs> in front of the screen, because we're going to have this be um, kind of a short chat, because we have a, a wonderful award to give um, at the end. And so I'm going to start um, uh, with you, Alan, and I want to talk a little bit about um, our conversation that we had with the community college presidents. Um, we had a, a wonderful panel the other day. Uh, Dr. Bahar was there, a lot of um, leaders that run organizations that do a lot of good work. And your part, and um, also a little bit of, of your part too, Rob, was to look at how can we partner better with federal agencies. Um, there's a lot of funding that's available. There's a lot of technical support that's available. And for folks in the room that might um, be actively engaged uh, with DC in some fashion, um, a lot of uh, colleges probably are leaving money preferably on the table because they don't know how to access that. So I'm going to start with you and ask you to comment a little bit, first of all, um, about your role, which is, is you're doing exciting work for the SBA and maybe touch on what is the low-hanging fruit from your perspective of your position, what might be available to people in the room. Sure, good afternoon, and thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Um, I want to tell you I'm committed to be here, uh, and, and obviously because I'm here, but a little side note, you know, when Rebecca and I were talking a couple, uh, like a month or two months ago, she's like, love to have you here, and we met at the uh, Rural Rise, and, and, and I uh, really saw, um, wanted to, we really wanted at the agency and the leadership of Administrator McMahon to look at thinking outside the box and approach, right? Uh, the agency, um, we have our standard uh, partners and uh, infrastructure that we do uh, through our 68 district offices, but I really want to look at ways that we can uh, really um, look at new partnerships, new things, new ideas, right? So I said, I'm there, count me in, I, I really look forward to it. And then, um, so a staffer of mine, she's, she goes, um, she's putting together my, uh, my itinerary and agenda and everything for my travel. And she goes, you're speaking on Monday? You're, you're traveling on Sunday? You realize that it's a federal holiday. <laughs> and then I said, she goes, oh, wow. And I said, no, I'm committed. I want to be here. So I want to tell you that, that uh, I'm here and I'm really glad that I, I did come and certainly meeting several of, of your leadership and all the great things that you, you all do day in and day out. And certainly you can count me in for next year uh, in Newport Beach, considering that I'm for, I grew up in Southern California. But uh, going back to SBA, certainly the low-hanging fruit. Um, I oversee all the entrepreneur development for the agency. So it's really close to a little bit more than one-fourth of the overall budget of the agency that I manage um, with a great infrastructure. I'm curious, just in show of hands, that of, uh, those that are familiar with the small business or you work with, uh, partnership with Small Business Development Center or Women Business Centers or SCORE. Okay, great. I see a lot of good hands. And that's great to see that um, because certainly um, that is one of my things that I certainly want to look at, uh, ways of establishing a stronger pathway in regards to uh, all of our, I call it my three lanes in terms of SBDCs, Women Business Centers, and SCORE. But I also have this other lane that I call, and I call it the HOV lane, right? Uh, the HOV lane in terms of initiatives, opportunities, partnerships that are not normally in your three lanes, but certainly an opportunity. So low-hanging fruit that I say that, um, that I think that it's in the near future to look at um, through your, your um, association and all your leaderships that are here is potentially in terms of workforce development that we talked about. Um, certainly the administrator, she's been already to 58 of the 68 district offices and we do round tables and meet with stakeholder uh, leaders and, and, and different uh, entrepreneurs and one of the things that we hear from 
small businesses and entrepreneurs is the challenge of, of, of finding uh, the workforce. It's great that we have a low unemployment uh, record right now, uh, lo you know, longest, uh, lowest in, in 50 years, but there's also that other part, right, um, in helping the individuals. So I see entrepreneurship, workforce development, also areas of innovative clusters, innovative clusters that, um, that I run is under my division too as well that we're expanding as well. So I'm gonna stop there a little bit because I know we have in interest of time, but I see that as a low hanging fruit. Certainly you're, those who raised your hand and are working with our, our, our research partners, great. I also wanna look at ways that we can think outside the box. In terms of also um, the relationship with the resource partners and some of the sub-centers and where's an opportunity for contracts or partnerships in that aspect. So um, hopefully that gives a little of insight. Thank you, Alan, that was really helpful. And um, you know, anybody who uh, of course wants to talk more about that and the partnership, we're all about partnerships and communities of practice. And that kind of leads me uh, next to you, Rob. Uh, you do a lot of good work with the USDA. Uh, we had an opportunity to have dinner last night with Dr. Bahar, so she's a very dynamic woman. She has great vision and appreciated um, her participation on the panel. So on calls that we've had over the last couple of months, I would love it if you would share with the audience a little bit about um, the work that you're doing at the USDA and particularly some of um, Dr. Bahar's priorities, some of the things we discussed. Yeah, so one of the things we've been, we've been looking at is the community colleges, we've been for years helping them develop entrepreneurial classes and get some of the business sense and trying to move forward. And one of the things we were thinking about is the classes are very you know, going really well, but let's give them some real life examples that they can actually work on. So we focused then at, at USDA in our intramural research program to target patented technologies that these classes then could work on, develop really business plans, develop a marketing strategy, how would you set up the business with some real life uh, technologies. And that was, that was fairly successful. So what we've done uh, just recently is decided that, let's go to the next stage, let's actually have those students in the community college create their own businesses. So what we've hooked up with is with SBA and the SBIR uh, uh, projects that if one of the, in, in, one of the problems we've, we found with the students in the small, uh, in the community colleges is, you know, the first thing you go to friends and family for funds. Well, there's no friends and family funds even available for the students. So, so they don't even have anything to get started. So by working with the, uh, the SBIR program, what we've been able to do is convince them that if some of the uh, students in the community college has one of our technologies, they've gone through and got a business plan already developed, that if they submit an SBIR proposal, can't we give them priority funding? And so what we started this last year and last year, the, na the average rate of the funding is about 16%. But last year, our funding rate for these, these particular programs was 85%. And so what it does, it, it basically gives the students a f almost a free, you know, 100% chance or 85% chance, you can get $100,000 for free uh, to actually kick the tires and start their business out. So I think it's a really, you know, program that we want to, you know, encourage more with the community colleges to take some technologies and it works so well at the USDA, the other federal labs are doing the same thing. So taking some federal technologies, using that in your business uh, uh, classes, and then creating businesses out of it. Well, thank you for that. And um, I'm going to turn to Joe now. Uh, Joe has done a lot of very good work in rural uh, areas, um, you know, really kind of inspiring presidents to do um, very impactful things by, you know, challenging them to really think like entrepreneurs. So he's got a lot to be proud of and has also um, trained and mentored um, many presidents in other states. He's a co-collaborator on some of our grants. Uh, one success, Joe, that you had recently with colleagues was um, putting together this Rural Rise Conference. Um, this is actually where I had a chance to meet Alan, um, Dr. Bahar, and, uh, and Rob, too. So it was really exciting, and I would like for you to share from your perspective um, what, you, what was the purpose of Rural Rise, you know, other than certainly the people I recruited onto the panel. What, what do you see as maybe some of the big accomplishments and some of the opportunities? Um, I'm going to answer that, but I want to take one step back because it, as it relates to the government, um, uh, in, t in 2016 I was appointed to the National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the U.S. Department of Commerce, 
Uh, and in that role, I was considered a special government employee. And what that did is it gave me a lot of opportunity to be able to see the role that government can play and has been playing in innovation and how we as community colleges can really take advantage of those opportunities. Serving as the entrepreneur in residence at Eastern West Virginia Community and Technical College, Dr. Terrell showed me the important role that collaboration can play. And so what that experience showed me was that if we go ahead and bring in um, a lot of the folks from the, the federal, state, and local governments and really give them an opportunity to hear and listen um, and work collaboratively, there's so many amazing things that can come about uh, from that. And one of those things was Rural Rise, which was uh, an event that we ended up putting together based on some of the experiences that we saw in rural communities across Appalachia. And it brought together over about 175 people from around uh, the United States who are ecosystem builders. And as a significant part of that, we reached out to federal government partners um, and it really gave us the opportunity to be able to learn a lot more about the various programs as well as engage them um, in thoughts and, and ideas about future opportunities to collaborate. And so the one piece of advice that I can give is that um, each of us are in various states and we have representatives from state and local and federal governments and finding ways and opportunities to really bring those folks into the fold into the programs in your entrepreneurship. There's so many amazing programs, SBIR programs, and the, the federal labs and all of the folks that I have encountered who are working on those programs really want to incorporate the National Science Foundation. They all want to be part of and here, and especially as a community college, we have the ability to be able to gain entree into those conversations in a way that a lot of other folks may not necessarily have. And I've seen that you know, in a lot of our conversations with Dr. Bahar and in a lot of our conversations as well. So Rural Rise has really provided a wonderful opportunity to be able to engage people, um, and it's something that I think all the colleges can, should consider. Okay, well, thank you, and I, I wish we had more time, but I do want you each to take a minute um, because I think a lot of the theme of this conference is really stepping outside of your comfort zone. Yes and, how might we do this? So I'm gonna ask each of you um, whether people are engaged with federal agencies and doing this work already or just getting started, what is one tip or suggestion that you would have for everyone in the room to really um, just get started and begin? So I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, two things. One is uh, certainly if you're, uh, it seems like you're already, but if not, to really work with our district directors uh, on that aspect. You know, I have 68 district offices across the country. I think that's a key low-hanging fruit in terms of establishing that partnership uh, with the district directors. And I mean that because from, from the administrator that we signed a recent MOU uh, with USDA, and we really want to do more in rural, rural America. And I think that you guys are the key conduit, that bridge, to really make that happen. And so there's a lot of good things that are going to be coming out of our MOU between both of our leaders, uh, our principals, and certainly want to uh, uh, keep an eye on that. We will, I promise you, and I know that USDA will as well, I'm already committing you to this, um, <laughs> but um, we will definitely use Rebecca, and, and in terms of getting all the information that you need to know, because sometimes things are sent out through grant.gov and this and that, and it can get lost, right? Uh, it, it, so we will make sure to get that information and those opportunities for all of you. Yeah, I think one of the things is, is just contact us. If you've got something really strange you, that you'd like to try, uh, we had a community college in Wisconsin that decided they wanted to have some of their life sciences majors actually working with the business majors in one class to put the two together, and they wanted to know if we had a patented technology that could be compatible for that class. So we said, oh, sure, we can find you something. So we found them a uh, peristaltic pump, a well pump, uh, a new way for a handicapped people to actually pump a uh, water at, at national parks. And so they went to the class and uh, they, they came up with a very interesting uh, market that said, well, this is a new procedure that you could use for dialysis pumps. So the class then had the biology students went to the engineering to try to re-engineer the patent and the business people came up with another plan. And so they actually re-engineered the USDA technology as a micro uh, peristaltic pump for kidney dialysis. So it, it, once again, it was the community college saying, you know, we'd like to try this. Do you have some technology that we could actually focus the class around? So just give us a call. The one thing that I would say is that, um, I, based on my experience, I've found uh, folks at the federal government to be really, really helpful. And I think that um, 
consider um, unexpected spaces and unexpected places. One of the places that we've recently begun working with very closely is the EPA, um, uh, based on some of the work that we're doing around biochar and a bio biochar initiative over at our community college. And they have bent over backwards to really help uh, create and facilitate introductions to an array of people that are uh, really helping us begin to get this industry off the ground. And so, you know, I'll, uh, obviously there's, there's a lot of great things going on in a lot of the agencies, but there's also other agencies that are a little bit smaller that oftentimes have resources as well that are um, potentially a little bit unexpected, but they can offer a wealth of resources, not only just to your students who are maybe entrepreneurs, but to the school as well. Wonderful. Well, I really appreciate you coming up here and we needed, we had so much good inspiration, but we got to get back into the weeds of how do we move things forward. So I thank you for your generosity and your thought leadership. So please give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So at this time, um, it's a very exciting opportunity, I think, for, for me personally. Uh, one of our board members had to leave early, was going to give this award, but selfishly, I really wanted to give it anyway, so uh, I couldn't be happier, uh, not that he's gone, but that I have this opportunity um, to recognize our, um, our winner this year for the, uh, the Heather Van Sickle Entrepreneurial College of the Year Award. So I'm going to ask Dr. Rick McLennan and his staff to uh, come to the stage. Thank you. Come on. So you and I sort of have a little bit of a history together. Uh, I can tell you I was not on the judging committee, so I didn't make this decision, but I couldn't have been more delighted um, that you were the winner this year for a couple of different reasons. Um, and please let, come up on the stage and um, join us here. Um, one of the things that NACI is very prides itself in is really recognizing um, excellence and, and risk taking. So um, uh, Dr. McLennan, I knew him before I worked for NACI and, and on my journey into NACI. And one of the things I really love about your college now and your former college, Garrett College, is that you believe very much in working with the community and, and a lot of the things that you've done. So. Um, obviously, you're surrounded by very uh, good people and a good um, history of a track record. So I'm going to come over here for just a moment because I want to share um, just a couple of things um, about your college. But um, North Idaho College has gone all in on being a regional hub of entrepreneurial education and support. Um, just in the past year, enrollment at North Iowa's um, AAS in business management and entrepreneurship technical cer certificate was at an all-time high and will continue to trend that way. It's one of the fastest growing areas of the country and um, they're taking advantage of every opportunity, whether it's a problem or a potential solution. So when uh, the committee uh, reviewed all the applications for colleges, there were certainly many, many distinguished ones. And I think what they found is some of the things that you're going to share with us in a moment um, were the reason that you uh, were what, th this year's winner. So it is my sincere pleasure uh, knowing you to present you with this year's uh, 2018 North Idaho College Award for Excellence. So. Congratulations, and I would invite you to uh, say a few words. Well, it's a, it's a great honor, and, and after um, spending three days with all of you and learning about the great work that you're all doing, it's very humbling uh, to receive this award. And I th before I say anything else, we're going to show a short video, if you'll indulge us. Thank you. The Vista Center for Entrepreneurship is where it all started here on North Idaho College's campus. Five years ago, we had a large grant to start an entrepreneurship program, and this was a first for our community college. And we grew that program to be one of the biggest entrepreneurship programs in the Inland Northwest. One of the reasons North Idaho College is a great place to launch a business is we have a wide range of programs here on campus. So whether you're a young student that really wants to learn how to make something that might turn into a product, or you already have an established business but you need more help, you can take it to a small business development center. It's been a real surprise as to how informative it is. The tools and the resources that are available and, and open to us, having the building blocks to be successful. 
Our mission is to help businesses thrive because thriving businesses create jobs in our economy. So we help them become extraordinary so they can actually have sustainable growth that are profitable. So one of the really things we're excited about is the future of entrepreneurship here at North Idaho College. So while we have Gizmo Coeur d'Alene, the Makerspace, and we have the Small Business Development Center, and we have this entrepreneurship certificate program that's really growing, what's next? And some of the things we've talked about is a rapid prototype lab. When I talk to entrepreneurs and small businesses across this community, there's a lot of ideas around products, but there's not a lot of spaces to actually develop products. So what we'd like to do is expand what we already have with Gizmo Coeur d'Alene in the makerspace and really add some high value tools so that our businesses in this community can really build prototypes and launch companies. They're learning about how to think forward. We work with the students on a hands-on kind of way, letting ex them explore projects they want to do, but also giving them opportunities to be working on bigger projects that are happening right entrepreneurship class has really changed my life. I've had such an awesome time ever since then. It's really helped me kind of get my feet grounded and be able to pursue what I call my dream now and really uh, inspiring me to do more than what I thought was possible. A little over a year ago, we asked ourselves the question, if we believe that supporting entrepreneurship is or should be a major pillar of a region's economic development strategy, especially a region like ours that has a lot of rural aspects to it. What should the role of a comprehensive community college like North Idaho College be in, in meeting that need? The answer to that question has been unfolding over the past year has been to create a cluster of programs and services that take our open access mission and direct it at, at entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial uh, support, teaching and learning. And we're really excited about this work and stay tuned because there's a lot more to come. These guys will uh, give autographs if you, if you want a little while later. We're, um, we're pretty excited about this work. Uh, we're building a community of, of, of energy and ideas and collaboration, and it really is all about collaboration. And we're doing it with a superstar team. You saw a couple of them there, uh, and here are two of them here. And, and I can tell you, this is what's making it work, is uh, they couldn't all come, but the, but the group of people who are involved in this work are some of the best people I've ever worked with in my entire career. And we're doing this with a sense of urgency for all the reasons that we've talked about here. In Idaho, Idaho ranks either at the, at the bottom or the very near bottom nationally of the go-on rate for higher education. Think of that, at the bottom, almost always. And so we know we can't afford to leave anybody behind. We need everybody on the bench and creating another way, another pathway into our institution to help learners uh, of all ages understand how they might see themselves in our story is pretty important to us. Uh, we're delighted uh, to receive this award. Uh, again, very humbled. Uh, thank you all and uh, enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>